There is a way that seems right to a man. That's what is told to us in scripture in the 14th chapter of Proverbs and the 12th verse. There is a way that seems, the scripture says, seems, S-E-E-M-S, -E -E seems right to a man. That speaks to the subjectivity of a man. That scripture, it not only speaks to the subjectivity of a man, it speaks to the failure of a man. And, and the reason why I say that is because, man, we still struggle today with identifying what is or isn't right. Which is why we constantly argue today over what is or isn't right which is why we constantly debate and even fight today over what is and isn't right. Now, while there is arguing and fighting and debating about what is right, scripture tells us that there simply is a way that is right. Not a way that seems right. Scripture tells us that there simply is a way that is right. No arguing about it, no debating it, because the way that is right is a way that is holy, that is righteous, a way that is divine. So let's take a look at this today. Let's take a look at the way that is right according to the word of God. We'll see it here spoken to us there in the third chapter of Proverbs, taking a look here at the first through the eighth verse here, where we'll see there Solomon, he starts off by saying, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. We'll see Solomon uh, says there. Now let's understand here, even though Solomon uses uh, and says there, my law, my commands, let's understand that Solomon, he governed himself by the way of God, by the law that is of God. So therefore, when we see here in this scripture, him talking about his commands there, his commands to his sons were the commands, the directions that come from the Lord, our God. We'll see there in the second verse that Solomon, he then stated that obedience to God's law will add length of days, he said there, he said that obedience to God's law will add long life and peace. This is to say that obedience will bring about a peace of mind, a peace of heart from, from whatever it is that we may encounter, whatever it is that we may go through in life, we will have peace of heart if we simply live in obedience to God's way. And so on the note of obedience there, we'll see in the third verse that Solomon, he then stated there, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Mercy and truth. I want you to underline, I want you to highlight that in your Bible. He said, let not mercy and truth forsake you. I don't see y'all marking that in your Bibles. Y'all better start coming with that highlighter. I like mark that in your Bible. Let not mercy and truth forsake you, he said. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. There is a reason why Solomon mentions mercy and truth there. Let's make a note of this, okay? Let's note here that mercy and truth, that is the way that is of God, part of the commands there. Okay, let's understand here today that mercy and truth, these are fruits born from God's grace. These are fruits that's born from love. Now, if you turn with me over to the, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and you take a look at the fourth through the seventh verse there, you'll see where Paul, he he wrote and he spoke of these fruits when he defined love to the people of Corinth. In that 13th chapter, 
of 1 Corinthians, Paul there in that fourth verse, he wrote that love suffers long and is kind. Love, Paul was saying there is patient. Love, again, the way that is of God, Paul was saying there is patient. He wrote there in that scripture that love, it does not rejoice in iniquity. Iniquity being wickedness, iniquity being sin. Love, God's way, does not rejoice in sin. It rejoices, Paul says there in that scripture, it rejoices in truth. Then Paul, he added on there that love, it bears all things. Meaning again, love is merciful. Again, Solomon said, mercy and truth, we should not forsake. And here Paul is saying here about love. That love, it is merciful. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. Paul said that it endures all things. Love is mercy and truth. Love is also full of faith. So when we take a look again at what, pa what Solomon said there in the third chapter of Proverbs, when he spoke about us not forsaking mercy and truth, he's telling us there that we should not forsake God's way, which is the way of love. Have you forsaken love today? Now, some of us, we will look at these statements from Solomon and, and from Paul there, and some of us, when we see them speaking about the way that is right, we'll see that, hey, that, that's just coming from two men's opinions there. They're talking about the way that is right, but that's according to their own opinion there. Let's wipe that understanding out right here, right now. If we take a look at the 22nd chapter of Matthew's gospel, and we take a look at the 37th through the 40th verse there in Matthew's gospel. That's again, the 22nd chapter of Matthew's gospel. And Jesus, he taught about the way that is right. And Jesus, he said in that scripture, if you're looking at it, you see that Jesus, he spoke about, he taught about the first and great commandment, which he said is to love the Lord, not half-heartedly, but to love the Lord wholeheartedly with one's whole heart, all of their soul. Then there in that scripture, Jesus, he said that the second command is just like the first. It is great. And he said that, that second command there, he said that it is to love again. Love, love, love. And this time around, Jesus said that that second command, which is great, by the way, he said that it is to love our neighbors as ourselves. That scripture should definitely be highlighted as many times as I have referenced it in sermons. I almost reference it every sermon that I preach. That should definitely be highlighted in your Bibles as well. So let's be very clear about this today. The way that is right is love. Let's be very clear about this today. Love is the right way. Love is the only way. Love is the way that is divine. It is the holy, the righteous, and the divine way. It is the way that is of God. The right way is to help, to support, and to uplift. That is the way that seems that that is the way that is right. And again, there is no arguing about it. There is no debating about it. One can't say that it is wrong to help somebody. One can't say that it is wrong to support somebody. One can't say that it is wrong to uplift somebody. So when we, again, go back and we take a look there at the fifth verse in the third chapter of Proverbs, Solomon, he tells us there 
to trust in the Lord. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, wholeheartedly, not some of your heart, not half-heartedly. You are to trust God with all of your heart. And then Solomon said there, don't you be leaning on your own understanding. He said, lean not on your own understanding. He said there again, in the first of my key verses here, he said, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Let's understand the right way is not only to, to love, the right way is to also trust. Okay, we, we, we are to, to trust in the Lord. We are to have faith in the Lord. We are to have faith in him, his way, and his own, his understanding. Not our own understanding. We are to trust his understanding over our own. That is the way that is right. We trust in his direction. It will lead us down the path of righteousness. And it will lead us to that door that he has set before us. It will lead us to that door that is open to us, to the pastor that is of Christ. It will lead us to glory, to honor, to righteousness, to everlasting life. And then we will be able to not only see that door, see that it is open, we'll be able to enter in. And, and I don't know about you all today, but I, I want to enter in. I, I want to enter into the pastor of Christ. I want to enter into his love, his eternal love. I want to enter into his joy. I want to enter into a place where there is no bitterness, where there is no hatred, where there is no tearing down, where there is no hurt, harm, or danger that, that, that will try to force itself onto us psychologically, emotionally spiritually. That's where I want to be. And again, in order for me to get there, I have to go in the way that is right. I must love and I must trust the Lord. Do you want to go there today? So again, we are left with a choice to make, aren't we? Once again, we are left with a choice. Will you go in the way that is right or Will you go in the way that seems right to a man? Unfortunately, many of us, we are choosing to go in the way that seems right to a man. Now, now something that the book of Proverbs, what it, what it does for us is it, it loves to highlight the difference in, in both of the ways, in the way that is right, and the way that seems right. We've already taken a look at the way that is right, but let's take a look at the way that, that, that seems right to a man so that we can understand the difference in, in both of them. Y'all want to take a look at that with me today? So if we take a look at the first chapter of Proverbs and that seventh verse, we'll start to, to get a, a clear vision in the difference of, of both ways. Where there in the seventh verse, the scripture, it plainly lays out before us. It states there, the fear of the Lord, again, the fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord. Y'all following along with me there? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, it says there. Fools despise, meaning that fools, they hate, they detest. Fools despise wisdom. Fools despise instruction is what the proverb tells us there. Again, those that fear the Lord will do everything they can to get right in his eyes. We fear his judgment. 
And, and so because we fear his judgment, because we fear his sovereignty, we don't want to face punishment, do we? I don't know about y'all, but I don't want God to be whooping my butt. I, I don't want God to be, be casting me away from, from his presence for all of eternity. So you know what I do, auntie? I do my best. I ain't perfect, but I do my best to live in obedience. And, and when I mess up, I say, oh, God, I messed up. And there are a lot of times where I try to beat God to the punch. I, I, I just don't want God to get on me. So I try to get out ahead of him sometimes. Say, God, I messed up. <laughs> Be merciful. Be merciful to me. I, I just want to stay on the right path. So, again, my goal is to enter into heaven. I don't know about the rest of y'all. But the fool here, the proverb says, despise wisdom and instruction. So what this verse makes very clear here for us is that those who, who choose to go in a way that seems right, they despise the right way. They despise wisdom. Wisdom is, again, fearing God. That's wisdom. Seeking his instruction. That's wisdom. But the fool, the proverb says there, despises. Despises wisdom and instruction. The fool, the proverb lays out for us, despises God's way. Now, when one despises God's way, they do it for well, quite a few reasons. One of those reasons is because they believe that their way is better than the Lord's way. They believe that their way is better than his way. The one who is omniscient, the one who is all knowing. Think about what that means for a moment to think that your way is better then the one who is all knowing and created all things that's known and unknown, visible and invisible. Think about what that means here for a moment. One to think that their way is better than God's way means that they trust themselves over the Lord. They trust themselves more than they trust the one that made them. They are the clay that turns around to the potter and say, hey, what are you doing? Such a person, they feel that they never have to lean on God for anything because their way is better. It is superior. Think about that. You moving with that kind of mindset today? I hope you're not. So one that would move that way, someone who would think that way, they don't fear God. They don't fear his judgment because they have no reason to. They are perfect. How many of us are perfect today? I don't see no hands raised. The way that seems right to a man. What way is better than God's way? Help me to understand that for a moment here the way that seems right to a man. If God's way is love, that is again, to help, to support and, and to uplift. And again, the food despises that way. What's opposite of helping, supporting and uplifting? What is opposite of love, but hate, right? Selfishness, right? Are we really saying that hate and selfishness is the way to go? I look around at the world today and that's all I see. Hate and selfishness on display. And then people sitting, oh yeah, 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 more, more, more. They clap at it, they laugh at it. What kind of world am I living in? What kind of world are we living in today? There are certainly many living that way today, full of hate, full of anger, full of bitterness. And, and many that do that, they even love to proclaim, listen to this, they love to proclaim that they are a child of God. When did God become hate? When, when, when did God become moving against one's neighbor? Because they black. 
because they have a different color of hair. Their hair may not be straight. Their hair may be nappy like mine. It may be curly. When did, when did God become one who hates someone because their skin is white? Or because they they may descend from, from an Asian person, Asian people. When did God become that God? Help me, help me to understand today. When God became that. So I want you to be attentive to me today when I tell you that living in such a way is living in the way of folly. That is living as a fool, living in a foolish way, going in the way that seems right to a man is going in the fool's way. Something that we're seeing a lot today and as also being clearly shown to us throughout history is that man has a pretentious nature about itself. What I mean by that is that man loves to exaggerate his importance. Man loves to exaggerate his worth. Man loves to exaggerate his stature. He loves to build himself up as if he is something that he is not. So when I say man has a pretentious nature about itself, I want you to understand that man wants to be more than what he is. Man desires to gain power. Man desires to gain glory. Man desires to gain honor. Man desires to be praised as, as if he is perfect, as if he is righteous. Man desires to be praised as if he is a God. Man has a God complex issue. One tries to take what isn't his as a show of power. One tries to to burn down everything that's around him so that people have to depend on him. Again, as if he is a God. Man tries to dictate, oppress, and, and suppress. Again, as if he is a God. We're seeing it today. We're seeing it a lot today. And history again shows us that this is a God complex issue and it is not healthy for those that move in such a way. And it's not healthy for those that are around them all because they are choosing to go in a way that seems right to a man throughout scripture. We are warned time and time again about having such a heart. One of those warnings we see there in the third chapter of Proverbs. Take a look at that seventh verse there for me. We'll see there in that seventh verse that Solomon, he warned, do not be wise in your own eyes. Isn't that what Solomon said there? He said, do not be wise in your own eyes. Solomon said, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Again, let's make this very clear here. Okay. Those who do not fear the Lord, Solomon is making very clear there that they are parting in the way that is evil. The way that seems right to a man is the way that is evil. Solomon again makes very clear there in that seven verse. And Solomon says there, do not be wise in your own eyes. If you are wise in your own eyes, guess what? You're moving in a way that is evil. And Solomon is telling you right here, right now, you need to depart from that evil. Paul, he said over in the third chapter of first Corinthians and the 18th verse, he said, let no one deceive himself. You start thinking that you wise in your own eyes, you deceiving yourself. Paul, he said, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you, seems to be wise, 
In this age, Paul said, let him become a fool that he may become wise. When, when he says there, let him become a fool, what Paul is saying that one needs to do there is that they need to let go of that pretentious nature. And, and they need to, to humble themselves. When, when one lets go of their arrogance, when we, when we let go of our pride, when, when we let go of our ego, we can then truly become wise and we can actually move in the way that is right rather than moving in a way that is harmful in a way that, that will hurt not just oneself, but again, all of those that are around them. There are many people today that need to become a fool. And again, what I mean by that is that there are many people today that need to let go of their arrogance. They need to let go of their pride and they need to let go of their ego so that they can get back on the right track and help themselves. And then all of those that are around them so that they can stop being so toxic in this world today. You see, something that we must understand today that all of these warnings that we're seeing here in scripture, these warnings, they are coming from a place of knowing the end result of the way that seems right to a man. All of these warnings that we see here today about having a God complex, it's coming from a place where this has already happened before. The example of, of going in such a way has already happened before it has been shown to us in scripture. And so we must heed these warnings. Now, if you don't know where these warnings are coming from, I want you to join me today in turning over to the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. In this chapter of Ezekiel, we are going to see God's greatest warning against having a pretentious heart, a heart that is full of arrogance and pride and, and full of ego. When you get to the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, I want you to take a look at, we're going to start at the 11th verse, and we're just going to work our way down from that 11th verse, quite possibly going all the way down to the the 19th verse there. We'll see there in the 11th and the 12th verse where we're told the word of the Lord, it came to Ezekiel and Ezekiel will see there that he was instructed to take up a lamentation. That is a, a letter of sorrow, a letter of mourning. He was to take up a lamentation. We're told therefore the king of Tyrus or Tyre. So who was this king? Why is God instructing Ezekiel to take up this lamentation for, for this king here? And the Lord, we'll see there in that 12th verse, that the Lord said that this king was the quote-unquote seal of perfection. Do we all see that? The Lord said there again in that 12th verse, I'm in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, if you're following along with me. The Lord said that this king was full of wisdom and, and perfect in beauty. Then there in the 13th verse, we'll see that the Lord said about this king, said that you were in Eden, the garden of God. Who is this king that God is, is talking about here? In Eden, the garden of God, God said that this king was in. Now, the only people ever recorded being in Eden that we know of in scripture was Adam and Eve. And let me tell you something. By the day of Ezekiel, Adam and Eve, they were long gone. They were not alive. So it definitely could not have been those two. Eve, if she was still living, she would have been a queen, not a king. And it certainly again, it wasn't Adam because like I said, they were long gone. So who is this king? Now when we take a look there at that 14th verse, things are start to, to become a, a, a lot more clear here for us. Where again, there in the 14th verse, we'll see that God, he said, 
you are the anointed cherub who covers. The Lord said there, I establish you. The Lord said there about this King, you are on the holy mountain of God. A cherub is an angel. And then a cherub is not only an angel, it is an angel that, that watches. It is an angel that stands guard. And this angel, again, we're told there in that scripture, had a high position on the holy mountain of God. So this, this angel here had a very important role, had a very high position here. It was the anointed cherub that covered, it watched, it guarded the throne of God. It watched, it guarded the holy mountain of God. We're talking about an angel. We are talking about the kingdom of heaven. This Eden that we're looking at here, this garden of God that we're looking at here in this scripture here, isn't talking about the garden that was in this world, but we're talking about the garden that was in heaven. Let's keep taking a look at this here. Because we'll see there in that 15th verse, the answer begins to become even more clear, just in case you haven't quite figured out who that king is just yet. The Lord said of this anointed cherub there that he was perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in him. This angel, this anointed cherub, one who stood guard, had iniquity, wickedness, sin, found in him. Then there in the 17th verse, we are told that the heart of this angel, this anointed cherub, that it was lifted up because of his beauty. If it is not clear to you yet who this king, this anointed cherub is, let me make it clear for you. Let me make it plain for you that God is taking up a lamentation to Satan. The devil is in sight here. Now, all of what the Lord has said here in, in this, this lament are things that the devil came to realize about himself. Satan, he recognized his beauty. And when, when, when we say his beauty there, we're not just talking about the outward appearance. I mean, think about what God said there in that scripture. Satan, he realized that he was wise. He realized his wisdom. He realized that he served in a very important role in the kingdom of heaven. He, he realized his, his position in the kingdom of heaven. And so when he began to realize these things about himself, guess how he started to think about himself? He started to think, oh, so high about himself. He thought very highly of himself. He became pretentious in his heart, arrogant in pride. He, he began to have that, that only I can do this. Only I can do that kind of mindset. I, 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 I. He had that kind of mindset. You better watch out when you're developing that kind of mindset. That old I, I got to do this. I got to do that. Only I, you better watch out with that mindset. That mindset is a dangerous mindset to have. And so again, when we take a look at that 17th verse there, we'll start to see that that pretentious heart that he had, it started to get the better of him because we're told there in that scripture that, that the devil, Satan, he corrupted his wisdom for the sake of his splendor, for the sake of his beauty and for his greatness there. In other words, again, Satan, he perceived his greatness. And again, it got the best of him. It caused him to think outside of God's way. There became another way to go, a way that seemed right to him. And so in 18th verse there, scripture tells us that Satan that he defiled his sanctuaries, that's his soul, by the multitudes of his iniquities, he defiled himself. The multitudes of his wickedness, the multitudes of his sin. What were the multitudes of his wickedness? 
In order for us to know that, we need to turn over. We need to do some more cross-referencing here. So let's take a look at the 14th chapter of Isaiah. And let's take a look at the 13th and the 14th verse there. Ezekiel, that's, by the way, that's behind Isaiah. So you need to, to go backwards to find Isaiah. If, if you're moving forward in your Bibles, you're going in the wrong direction. Isaiah comes before the book of Ezekiel. So there in the 13th verse of the 14th chapter of Isaiah, the scripture speaks of Lucifer, which again, that's another name of the devil. That's another name of Satan. That's what he was known as before he was known as the dragon. We're told there in that scripture that in his heart, he said that he would, listen to this, ascend in heaven, that he would exalt himself. He would exalt his throne above the stars of God. Look at that. Then there in the 14th verse, we'll see where again, he said that he would ascend, rise up again above the heights of the clouds. And look at this, be like the most high to be like God. Satan was, was lifting himself up here. Pride, arrogance, and ego on full display here. Talk about a God complex. He, he thought so highly of himself that he was putting himself over everything, over all of creation, and even God himself. His heart, his pretentious heart, it was giving birth to his own righteousness, not righteousness that's, that was of the Lord, but his own righteousness, his self-righteousness. His self-righteousness was his undoing. His self-righteousness was his doom. It's what led him, as we're told, as we were told there in the 17th verse of the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, it it's what led him to be a cast down to the ground. Jesus, he said that, that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He fell from glory, from honor, and from righteousness. He fell from the way that is right. This is a warning to us today about going in a way that seems right. This is a warning to us today about that arrogance, that pride, and that ego. I warn today that man has fallen in love with itself. We have fallen in love with our splendor. And we love to boast about ourselves. And I can't figure out what it is that we have to boast about. But we do it anyway. We like to boast of our pride and our dominion over this world. But this world, when you look at it, this world is constantly at war. There's always some kind of war that's being fought, one way or the other. All the time, most of us will start thinking about the Middle East. But look here at home. We're at war today. All again, because of the way that seems right, to a man. We like to boast of our wisdom and, and many are so proud today in thinking that they know everything that they say matter of factly that there is no God. Uh oh, there we go. Just like the devil, raising ourselves up. We are so proud to, to know everything when the fact of the matter, the actual truth is that we know little to nothing. Man is so proud of his advances. And again, I'm still trying to figure out what are our advances? We haven't figured out yet that love is better than hate. We haven't figured out yet that it is better to help somebody than to not help somebody. We, we haven't figured out yet that it is better to share than to be greedy. We, we talk about our advances. What are our advances? 
We aren't going in the way that is right today, collectively. Man is so proud of his way when we still haven't learned the moral of Satan's story. The moral of Satan's downfall is pride goes before destruction. We've heard that before. And we've heard before that a haughty spirit goes before a great fall. Pride goes before the fall. We still have not learned the moral of the story that we need to be letting go of our pride and we need to be letting go of our ego today. We need to go in the way that is right. We need to turn away from the way that seems right. Because the way that seems right to a man, as the scripture says, it leads to disaster. It leads to destruction. It leads to death. So again, when we take a look there at that seven verse in the third chapter of Proverbs, we are encouraged. We are encouraged not to be wise in our own eyes, but to fear the Lord and to depart from evil. We are in the position that we are in today because we are too stubborn to turn from being wise in our own, in our own eyes. We are where we are today. And, and again, we're becoming more and more consumed with a way that is leading to nothing but hurt, pain, and suffering. Because many of us today think that hate and bitterness is the way to go rather than love. Again, the sad part about this is that many of us, we have become blind by our self-righteousness. We have become so blind that we can't even see the way that is right. We can't see it and we don't want to hear about it today. We don't want to hear Jesus talking about loving our enemies. We don't want to hear Jesus talking about doing good to those that hate us. We don't want to hear Jesus talking about how we should be praying for those who spitefully use and those who persecute us. We don't want to hear about that. We just want to keep going in a way that seems right to us. Paul, he said in his letter to the Roman church in Romans, the first chapter in the 28 verse, Paul, he wrote that those who do not like to retain God in their knowledge, they are given over to a debased mind to things which are not fitting, to things which are not right. God, if you want to keep going in the way that seems right, he will permit you. He will allow you to continue to go in the way that seems right. He will let you have your, your unrighteousness, Paul said. He will let you have your sexual immorality. He will let you have your wickedness and your covetousness and your maliciousness. Paul said that the Lord, if you want to keep on going in the way of envy and in greed, Paul said that God will let you keep on going in it. You see, he has given us the freedom of choice. Such freedoms that many people keep trying to tear away today. God gives it to us to live how we desire to live. But again, we must understand if you choose to go in the way that seems right, there is a consequence because again, the way that seems right to a man is in is destruction. So let's understand here today, right now that self-righteousness is not the key to success. Self-righteousness is not the way to go. The key to, to prospering, the key to, to being blessed is the way that is of humility. We need to be humbling ourselves today. If you turn to the 16th chapter of Proverbs and you take a look at the, the 19th and the 20th verse there, Solomon, he said, better to be of a humble, uh, of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Solomon said, he who, he who heeds the word wisely will find good and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy 
is he. Again, let me repeat that one more time, just in case you, you hadn't found that yet. In the 16th chapter of Proverbs, and the 19th and the 20th verse, I hope you're highlighting that in your Bible. Solomon said, better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil, riches, with the proud. He who heeds the word wisely, Solomon said, will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. These are words that's coming from a man that had everything. Solomon, he had wealth. Solomon, he had riches. He was the king. He had power. And look at Solomon here saying that having a humble heart is the way. We are at a pivotal moment today. God is giving us another chance. He's giving us another opportunity. He is giving us a choice today to turn away from hatred, to turn away from bitterness, to turn away from a way that seems right and to go in a way that is right. He has given us another chance, another opportunity, but what will we do with it today? As I said last week, character is important. Character is important. Having the character of love is important. And now today, letting go of that self-righteousness and having humility, the character of humility is important as well. Because you see, when we move with love and with humility, we are able to go down the path that is right. And again, when we go down that path of love and humility, we are going heeding the instructions of God, we are able to enter into his kingdom. And so again, we have a choice today. Will we move in the way that is right, love and humility, or will we go, or will we go in a way that seems right? A way that is selfish, that is filled with anger, that is filled with greed, bitterness, hatred, violence. Will we go in that way, a way that leads in destruction. So that you aren't blind or confused again to the path that is right, let me tell you today, humble yourself, fear the Lord. And when you fear the Lord, he is going to guide you down the path that is right. Amen. 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 Hey, before you stop watching this video, I got one thing that I wanna ask all of you to do. What is it that I want you to do? If you aren't already following this channel, I ask you today, make sure that you're following. Subscribe below. And if you do that, I also ask all of you, make sure that you share this video, this channel with someone somewhere so that all of us can grow in our wisdom, our knowledge, and our faith in the Lord. And I ask all of you, participate in today's sermon as well. If you have any questions or any comments, don't be afraid to leave a comment below.